All right, good afternoon. This is Mr. Melvin Davis, right? Mr. Davis? Yes, ma'am. You introduce yourself, tell us your name and DOC number, please. Melvin Davis, 310198. All right, Mr. Davis, let me uh, acknowledge the guests that we have here with us and that you have there with you. Here in Baton Rouge, we have Sophie Cole and uh, Marlene. Merlin. Merlin. Merlin Renard. Um, to also joining us, we have the Parole Project, Mr. Myers, uh, <clears throat> Anita Michelle Davis, Matthew Wells, Donald Davis, Rosalind Ratcliffe, uh, Minnie Robinson, Bobby Stubberfield, Rhonda Davis, there with you, Ashton Falls. Anthony Hill, Danny Davis, also at the penitentiary, Isaac Manuel, Dana Hill, Juan Dabney, uh, Gerald Joseph there with you, as well as Matthew Wells, Ingrid Manuel, and Mary Wells. So we have lots of folks who are participating with us today. First, Mr. Davis, I'm going to read some information into the record, then I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Jackson. See you to my far left. Your case has been assigned to her this morning. And we'll hear from the warden uh, and those folks who've indicated they'd like to speak. You'll be allowed to make a statement before we turn it over to your attorney, Ms. Myers. Ms. Myers, would you like to in introduce yourself for the record, please? Yes, ma'am. Amy Myers on behalf of Parole Project. Um, and I'd love to make a brief comment at the end. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you. So, Mr. Davis, you're here seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in Jefferson Parish. Uh, in 1996, you received a life sentence for a second degree murder conviction. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and I did not acknowledge that we do have a representative from the DA's office in Jefferson Parish who wants to speak, and we'll call on him also. Would you uh, answer Mrs. Jackson's questions? Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Davis. How are you? I'm fine. You... That's good. That's good. Um, how old are you, Mr. Davis? 49. And how much time have you actually served uh, in this case? 29 years. So you were 20? Yes, ma'am. It's fun? Yes, ma'am. So tell us something about what was going on in your life when you were 20. What were you in school? What was your job? Just tell us about your, your life at 20. Um, yes, ma'am. I didn't have a job at that time. Um, I was a 20-year-old crack addict. Um, I didn't have a place to stay. I didn't have a job. I didn't have an education. I was living on my brother's couch at that time. Well, when did you start using drugs and how did you become a 20-year-old crack addict? I started using drugs at the age of 13. I started smoking marijuana. And at the age of 16, I was introduced to crack cocaine. Who made the introduction? I didn't, I didn't hear that. Who made the oh, my brother did. And was this an older brother? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, is he the one who was involved in this crime with you? Yes, ma'am. What about your parents? Where were your parents? It was home, but they didn't tolerate my activity. Okay, so you actually had a place you could have gone, but you chose not to do that because they did not approve of your uh, lifestyle. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, how far did you go in school? To the seventh grade. And how, why did you only go to the seventh grade? Um, I dropped out of school and I was sentenced to the juvenile detention center in Baton Rouge. Okay, so you got in trouble when you were in the seventh, how old were you in seventh grade? Um, I was like 13, ma'am. And you got in trouble and while you were in the seventh grade? Yes, ma'am. What kind of trouble was that? Um, I got, uh, got, uh, Put out of school from smoking marijuana. All right. Well, go to court and pick up a charge as a juvenile? 
Yes, ma'am. I had two uh, possession of stolen property charges. All right. And you uh, came to Baton Rouge to uh, LTI? Yes, ma'am. How long did you stay there? 18 months. You had a GED while you were there? No, ma'am. Um, did you make any efforts? Were any uh, classes offered? Yes, ma'am. It was offered. I was actually a attending school, but um, by the time that I was released, I was unable to complete it. Okay. And when you got out of uh, LTI, where did you go? I started, I went and got a job permit to start working at McDonald's. And I, started, work. I was uh, 15, right at 16 years old. And so you got a job permit, you went to work at McDonald's. Who were you living with? Oh, uh, my parents. Okay. Um, and when did you pick up your conviction as your first conviction as an adult? I was living with my parents. I had a possession of stolen property charge. I had a stolen motor vehicle. Okay. And did you get probation or did you go to jail? I went to jail. I um I received probation for that uh that crime. Okay. Uh so who were you living with when this crime was committed? I was living with my brother. Why weren't you living with your parents? Because of the lifestyle that I was living, I couldn't live there. They permitted that. Okay, so you had a job, you got out of LTI, you had a job, went, started living with your parents. So at what point did you uh, go back to your old lifestyle? Basically right after I got out of LTI. I wasn't doing that well then. I was still um, using drugs immediately after I got out of LGI. And I was okay. still using drugs up until my day of me being arrested for this charge. All right, well, let's, let's go ahead and talk about uh, January 15th, 1994. Tell us what happened. On that day, my brother put together a plan to ride the occupants of 1348 Myrtle Street. Um, after he found out they had a large amount of drugs at that residence, he decided that he needed some help. So he asked me, I originally said no, because I didn't want to have anything to do with that. I would just, I just put in the application to um, be a baker at McKenzie's Bakery at that time. But I changed my answer to yes. So, not only did I agree, my co-defendant Cedric agreed as well. So we got in the car and went round to the residence. Linda Robinson was standing outside. And as we got out of the car, my brother placed a gun on her as we approached the door and had her to knock on the door for we can enter. Uh, my co-defendant Cedric Gibbons handed me a nine millimeter handgun. As we entered the residence, um, everybody was placed on their knees, and my co-defendant said to give and took Cynthia Robbins to the black to look for the, uh, the drugs that was inside of the residence. As he came out of the back, and he said, I have everything, but he called my brother name. And when he called my brother name, he was leaving out of the door. And as he Hello. was... Uh, who called your brother's name? My co-defendant, Cedric Givens. All right. He called, so he called your brother's name. Yes, ma'am. And when he called him by name, Rod Johnson said, that's okay, we know who y'all are anyway. So as my co-defendant was leaving the residence, Rod Johnson jumped up and he started to run. When he started running, I started shooting at him. As he ran and disappeared out of the Why did he start shooting at him? I didn't know what he was going to get a gun or what. I didn't know. I, I was nervous at that time. I didn't know what was going on? I was acting off an of impulse, and I just started shooting at him, ma'am. Now, four people were actually shot, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And one, um, um, a 15-year-old was the one who actually died, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Who shot the 15-year-old? My brother did. 
Okay. Let's talk about um, Miss. Did you say Linda Johnson? Is that her name? Linda oh, Robinson. Robinson. You shot Miss Robinson and two other people. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Let's talk about your shooting of Miss Robinson. Why did you shoot her? Yes, ma'am. At that time, when John Hawkins started to run and I started shooting at him, I looked and I seen Miss Robinson heading towards the door. And when I saw Miss Robinson heading towards the door, I started shooting her and shooting at her as well, striking her 22 times. Even clearly, I can see that she was pregnant. And as, as I turned and looked, I seen. Oh, wow. Well. You shot it, you shot, you fired 25 shots into Ms. Robinson's body. According to the police report, let me pull it up. According to Ms. Robinson's statement to the police at the time, she identified you as the person who stood over her and shot con and continuously shot her. So she wasn't running when she got shot. She was down on the floor. You stood over her and you pumped 25 bullets into her midsection. Uh, she was seven months pregnant and you shot her over 20 times. Isn't that the way it happened? Yes, ma'am. But that's not what you just told the board. And I will tell you, Mr. Uh, Davis, Honesty at this point is the best thing that you can do. Uh, and your efforts to minimize this really horrible crime doesn't serve you very well. This lady was down on the ground, seven months pregnant, and according to the report, she had injuries over 25% of her body. So all of those bullets were concentrated in her midsection and she was obviously pregnant. So why would you do that? Yes, ma'am. At that time in my life, I was addicted to crack cocaine. I was acting off of impulse. I just, my life just was constantly spinning out of control. But that's not the person that I am today. Well, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But again, you know, four people shot, 15 year old died, a uh, seven month old fetus was killed inside uh, the mother's womb. And miraculously, she survived being shot in excess. And there are other people in the house, but nobody went to the excess that you did. You know, no, nobody else shot as many people or showed so much disregard for human life as you did. So help us understand that. At, at that, yes, ma'am. At that time in my life, I was acting off a low impulse. Between the drugs, not sleeping, constantly using drugs on top of days, on top of days without any rest, my life just was a total mess. I had no control of myself at all. I just wanted the drugs out of the house and I just wanted to leave. I wasn't thinking at all at that time. Well, let's talk about uh, your drug addiction and what kind of programs you've taken uh, to address what, according to you, uh, 
or the situation that had taken over your life. So tell us all the drug treatment programs that you've been involved in. Yes, ma'am. AA, substance abuse, and NA, ma'am. That's it? Yes, ma'am. That was all the only programs that I have, have um, available oh. to me at this moment. Well, but you've been in prison for uh, 29 years. I'm sorry. 29 years. They had to have been available to you prior to this moment as you describe it. I mean. Yes. I have. Yes, ma'am. I have taken them throughout the course of the years. And right now, I'm actually still going to NA and AA meetings twice a week. Okay. Anything else? That's it. I constantly um, mentor other guys as well because of the drug well, addiction. You know, I want to talk about uh, what kind of treatment you were in a, uh, a, a drug treatment program at Angola, right? Yes, ma'am. And what was that program? That's the... Um, Substance abuse program that was initially. Tell us about it. Does it have a name? Oh, uh, just basically, uh, it was the Phelps uh, substance abuse program that was at Camp C at that time. How long did that? How long was that program? The program was. Um, it was a three month course that I went through. Um, to receive okay. the drug treatment. So you had a three month course, and then you did some AA and NAs, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and you completed that substance abuse program in 2015, does that sound about right? Yes, ma'am. All right, and tell us about your participation in AA or NA. Well, AA, um, when so I started AA, after I completed AA, I went to NA. Oh, and did you do AA? I didn't did hear you. you do, when did you do the AA program? AA was in 2015, and I did it again in 2016. Okay. And since then? Yes, ma'am. I constantly um, attend uh, AA meetings twice a week. And what have you gotten out of those programs? I actually was going to understand. Well, first, are consider yourself an addict today? Yes, ma'am. I know that once an addict, I'm always an addict. And I constantly. So how, how do you feel? How, how do you um, address that if you ever release? How do you? How do you assure that you're not going to go back to a life of drugs and addiction? I constantly surround myself around positive people, and I make a conscious decision every day not to get high. And I also attend the weekly meetings twice a week to make sure that I don't fall back into that category that I once was. Think power is enough? Ma'am, I think willpower is enough. No, ma'am. I know continuance through prayer and going attending AA meetings, NA meetings. I know that I can do it through there. Uh, you have children. No, ma'am. I see you took inside out dads and Malachi dads. Why did you take those programs? Yes, ma'am, because I have nieces and nephews, and I wanted to make sure those, those same values that I'm learning that I can pass it on to them. And uh, what's your current job at facility? Yes, ma'am. I am uh, right now, I'm currently an inmate counselor. I have been, at, been holding that job for nine years now. Um, that job consists of me um, filing legal grievances, um, DB court, um, legal interviews, um, 
guys and uh, trusted with me to make sure that I do the right thing with confidentiality, make sure that I don't say anything about their cases if they may have co-defendants or anything like that. Uh, what other jobs have you had? I had, um, I actually used to work in a laundry, ma'am, for eight years. I worked in a cell block. I worked at a healthcare only to make sure guys would be able to get in and out of the shower, get on the, get to the call outs, um, where they need to be. What's your trustee status? A class A trustee, ma'am. How long have you had that status? For eight years. I see that you've had 12 write-ups. That yes. correct? Yes, ma'am. Remember when your last write-up was? Yes, ma'am. 2015. What was that for? For aggravated disobedience. I had so, head. Go ahead. I had headphones on during the count, and they recounted, and I had the headphones on, and I didn't hear that it was a recount. And I was found. They found me, and they wrote me up and locked me up behind that. But however, since then, I don't wear headphones anymore during count time. Um, you have lots of opposition. Um, you can't control. Uh, I would tell you the current judge, the DA, the sheriff's office, the victim's aunt, the victim's brother, uh, and other members uh, and the victim's father had no comment, and there was a sister who was not opposed, uh, but you do have uh, some opposition. So tell us, why do you think that we should um, grant relief today? Because I'm no longer the same person that I once were. I have taken the necessary steps to change my life. I realized that I made a lot of mistakes in my life and I couldn't continue to live the same way that I was living. So I started taking programming and try to do everything that I can to make sure that I never fall back into that same place that I once were at that time. I know that through programming, it helps. I know that being a responsible citizen comes with a responsibility to aid in society and build up society and want the same thing that I want for myself that I should want for others. Um, where's your brother? Um, my brother, they have one on the screen, um, oh. Zoom, that's looking Oh, uh -huh. yeah, I mean, um, Ronnie Davis, he's down the wall uh, on the West Yard, East Yard. Okay. Uh, what about your sister? Did she have any from uh, Mary Wells, is that your mom? Yes, ma'am. Well, in her letter, she says you were wrongfully convicted. Why did she, Why do you think she feels that way? I don't know, ma'am. Maybe because of the way that um, it's probably uh, feel that I didn't receive a fair trial, I'm thinking. Well, but you actually killed, I mean, you didn't kill the young boy who died, but you shot three other people and uh, killed a baby before it was born. So why did she think you were wrongfully convicted? I can say that, yes, ma'am. I would say that because of, of I, have, I have tried over several years to get certain legal documents, and I think that played a part in that as she felt that I was uh, wrongly convicted because of the documents that I was trying to obtain that she wasn't able to obtain. Do you feel like you, do you feel like you were wrongfully convicted? Oh, no, ma'am. Not at all. I know that I'm guilty. And you've acknowledged that to your mother? Yes, yeah, she knows that I'm guilty. Everybody that's sitting behind me, ma'am, know that I'm guilty of this crime. So if you were successful, uh, what would be your transition plan? Yes, ma'am. I would be transitioning to the parole project, maybe three to four weeks to uh, receive programming, 
Then after that, I would be living with my sister at 3733 Blanchard Drive in Chermet. She would be responsible for bringing me to and from work. I'd be working at um, Davis Catching Transportation. While I'm working there, I'll be saving money to obtain my CDL's driver's license. I actually started a CDL trucking school here in Angola. But when it closed down in West Yard, I was um, unable to con continue to contend. But also I have the opportunity to attend Operation Sparks to become a full stack junior software developer because of my master certification in computer fundamentals. So that you did get that and you also got your GED. And yes, so ma'am. Like, yes, ma'am. Well, um, on those accomplishments. All right, this is Renata, so that's all I have. Oh, I'm sorry, Warren, what could you tell us about uh, Mr. Davis? Um, Mr. Davis is a, a, a MA counsel, uh, minimum A uh, trustee, uh, and everything else that you said is true. He also participated in Malachi Dad, which is a great program here. Um, and it's tired as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Not, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. We'll hear from uh, the folks who are here in support. First, we'd like to hear from uh, Mr. Davis' sister, Ms. Anita Michelle Davis. Just say, you can say that. Yeah. Okay. Just talk about it. Good afternoon. My name is Anita Michelle Davis. I am the youngest sibling. Uh, my mother Mary and I have to be blatantly honest with you today. It has been very difficult for me to hear because I had never heard this story before. And for me, I want to extend an apology. Because I feel like as his sister, knowing what he had been, what he was going through at the time, I feel like I failed him. And I know I am only a year older than him, but in my heart, I wish I could have done more to save my brother from the crime that he committed. But I know my brother has a good heart, and I know that he is capable of loving. And I just ask that from the bottom of my heart, if there's any way that he can be forgiven and he can be quite in the seat today. I do wish that I didn't have to hear this because I didn't. And I don't see my brother in that light. He has always been loving and caring unto me. And that somehow, as he was supposed to be granted clemency, I would take him into my home and I would provide for him food, clothes, and shelter just to make sure that he is. Um, introduced back into society and I would see to it that he goes to the classes or whatever it is that he needs to go to that he could be productive. I have um, a plan for him. I want him to create a vision board and I just want him to have a productive life. So I can say it because this really hurts. Yes, ma'am, thank you. We do appreciate your comments. Um, Rosalind Radcliffe, please. Like on trees. The other page. There you go. Is Excuse me, Rosalind cannot log in. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can we hear now, though, from uh, Ashton Falls, nephew? Actually, um, Matthew Wells, um, Melvin's stepfather, was going to be the other live speaker. Please, Chairman. Okay. Well, we'll hear from Mr. Wells. 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody here. My name is Matthew Wells, and I'm Larry Davis' stepfather. And I just come to let you all know that there's been a change in his life. And he don't no longer desire to do those things that he did. And he has he admitted his wrong done, and he's a better man now. He, uh, Really, why I enjoy speaking for him because he's a born again Christian. His life has been changed. The thing he used to do, he don't do those things no more because he have God guiding in his life. And I just like for y'all to allow him another chance to be out in the free world to make a better man out of himself. The whole thing that passed, that passed away in his life, and all things have become new. So I want to thank this prisoner for what they have done for him. And I want to thank his lawyer for representing him today. And I want to thank, I want to congratulate Melvin for putting the work in that he has put in to come home to his family. And today I would just love to see y'all help him in that area if you could find enough love in your heart to do so. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Do we hear from Mr. Myers, Parole Project? Yes, good afternoon. Kerry Myers, Louisiana Parole Project. Mr. Mr. Davis is a client of Parole Project. Uh, we support his, uh, we'll support him through his transition uh, should he get a recommendation today. Um, I'd like to point out that, that at his age, at right now, right at 50 years old, Mr. Davis is at a critical point in his life where he's very viable. Uh, uh, to, to be in uh, employment. Uh, he has an opportunity uh, to contribute to his community. He has, he's also about to complete a Braille transcriber certification. Uh, we have one client currently now that just got two job offers, uh, job offers with that same certification. So that also makes him uh, uh, very employable. Um, you can see the difference between the 20 year old uh, drug addicted Mr. Davis and the 50 year old Mr. Davis today, and the commitment and the work that he's done on himself. Uh, he has tremendous support. Um, he has parole project to help him through his transition. Uh, we will make sure that he goes through all the evaluations uh, that are needed um, through mental health and substance abuse evaluations. We know that he will comply. He's already told you that, that his sobriety is extremely important to him, that he will continue to go to meetings. Um, and he will follow any other recommendations. I know that, that uh, through those evaluations, uh, he'll also learn the skills that he needs. He'll have the peer support that he needs from people uh, who have already been through what he has been through, uh, through the steps, uh, or what he will go through, who has already been through there, knows the obstacles and knows how to navigate those obstacles. Uh, so that way he will have the best possible chance of success. Uh, so with our support and support of his family, um, and the and the work that Mr. Davis has done to become the person he is today, we ask this board uh, to consider his application and grant his relief today. Thank you. All right. Uh, this time we'll hear from the DA's office, Mr. Meyer. Good afternoon, Randall Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish. Um, it's one of the few cases we've had where we have, I think, three Myers involved. And I believe none of us, uh, there's no relation between any of the three. Um, we're opposed at this time to Mr. Uh, Davis's request for a commutation of sentence. This was a, you know, he was on supervision at the time of the offense. Uh, it was a home invasion where four people were shot and, and pretty horrific crime where he, he stood over somebody and shot him over 20 times in, in killing an unborn child. Um, we feel that 29 years is, clearly not sufficient time for him to have served for this horrific crime. And there's very strong victim opposition. Um, I, I spoke with some of the victims last week and they had told me that they were gonna appear today, but apparently something occurred and they were not able to appear. Um, so for those reasons, we were opposed to his request for commentation. Thank you, we appreciate your input. 
All right, uh, Mr. Davis, is, before we turn it over to Ms., uh, your attorney, is there anything you'd like to say to us? Yes. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. I thank this board for this opportunity to be able to speak my truth here today. And I'd like to tell the board that I'm no longer the same person that I once were. My life has made a tremendous change. Through programming and education, I have totally realized now that there's another way of looking at life. I don't have to, I don't have to continue to do the things that I once was doing. I know through education, there's more opportunities. And I never would have thought that I would have had the opportunity to actually be a Braille transcriber. I never thought I'd have the opportunity to get a GED. I never thought I would have the opportunity to have a master's certification, have the opportunity to attend Operation Sparks, to, be, to, to become a full stack junior software developer. I never had those opportunities. I realized right now in my life that I made a lot of mistakes in my life. And I know that I'm very, very sorry for that. I know that I hurt a lot of people. I even hurt my own family. I tore them apart as well as the victim's family. And I apologize to everyone that is involved that I committed a crime against. I, I, I apologize to the community as well. And I thank this board for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Myers. Thank you. Melvin made a series of poor decisions as a teenager from selling drugs as the 13 year old right up to agreeing to his brother Ronnie's plan to rob the victims in this case. Melvin had to face his moral failings and decide who he wanted to become. Today, he's a trusted and respected member of the LSP community and inmate counselor with the highest ranking trustee level. Melvin is a long way away from the 20 year old angry uneducated man who committed this terrible crime. Melvin worked very, very hard to obtain his GED, which he got in 2018 something that did not come easily like it does for some people. Um, Melvin is trusted and reliable. The role of inmate counsel substitute for nine years is an incredibly difficult role that requires not only legal skill, but also great compassion. Melvin is a positive influence on other inmates here at LSP and he encourages others to further their education as he has gotten so much benefit himself. For example, Another inmate, Robert Lee McKee, wrote that Melvin was instrumental in him getting into the Braille certification transcriber program because he felt inspired by Melvin. Uh, as Kerry said, if Melvin is released, he will be one of the few people in Louisiana that is a certified Braille transcriber, a very sought after skill. Um, Melvin's 15 years sober and he is very strong in his sobriety and he has a plan if he's released to continue his NA um, in Chalmette with his sister Anita, who you heard from today. Uh, on behalf of the Davis family, Parole Project, and all of Melvin's friends, we respectfully pray you recommend Melvin for a commutation of sentence to 60 years. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, no, I'd like to move for executive session. Okay. We have a motion and second for executive session. Uh, can you call the roll? Sure. Yes. 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 All right. We have an unanimous vote. We'll be in executive session for a few moments to discuss confidential matters. All right. We are back in regular session and we are prepared to vote. Um, Mrs. Jackson will be voting first. All right, Mr. Davis, I'm going to be honest with you. This has been a very difficult case for me because this was just a horrible, horrible crime. Horrible. Uh, even though you weren't the one who actually shot a 15-year-old, you are equally as guilty because you were involved in everything that happened. And then your own actions. Absolutely uh, inexcusable. Absolutely inexcusable. Um, but, you know, you have accomplished quite a bit uh, over the course of the last almost 30 years. You only had two write ups, the last being in 2015. You have done some um, good programming. 
uh, you have um, a good support system if uh, your family and the parole project. And while there is some opposition, uh, you know, the victim's sister, and this is apparently the 15-year-old who died, she's unopposed and his father chose to make no comments. And so uh, in light of your rehabilitative efforts over the last uh, 30 years and your conduct record, uh, my vote today would be to recommend a commutation sentence to 60 years. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Olson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Davis, I listened to the interview intently with Ms. Jackson. I, I knew that you had been a constant substitute for nine years. So you've been legally advising and representing people in this very thing and other legal matters. You are represented by one of the best legal agencies that I know in the state, the Louisiana Parole Project and, and Attorney Myers. And I know they advised you and gave you counsel that today was a day of complete truth, complete responsibility. And I repeatedly, repeatedly heard you say, I didn't know exactly what I was doing. I was acting on impulse. I was on drugs. But you had enough uh, bearings and you knew exactly what you're doing. When you went to the house, you had a gun, and you robbed and stood over a pregnant woman and shot her in the exact place, her abdomen, her midsection, 20 times. You knew exactly what you did. All you had to do today is tell the complete truth take full responsibility for your action. You didn't do that today. You made excuse after excuse, and that doesn't sit well with me. Based on a lack of full responsibility, based on adamant opposition from the whole legal community in Jefferson Parish, nature of the crime and the victim's family is adamantly opposed. My vote is to deny your request based on everything I just articulated. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Marabella. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Davis, uh, all of our cases are hard. Your case presents uh, uh, a very difficult decision for me. I, I've listened uh, to what you had to say. I've listened to all of my colleagues. And I think that's the, the way our process works. Is we all come away maybe with different impressions and different opinions. Uh, after listening to your interview today, uh, I'm willing to take a chance on you. I agree with Judge Jackson. I vote would be to uh, recommend to the governor that you commute your sentence to 60 years. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, echoing what Mr. Marabella and Jackson both said, uh, it is a tough case. And, 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 you know, I don't know, I was torn both ways, but my vote today will be to grant and commit the 60. All right. Uh, Mr. Davis, there's no question. I think we can all agree this was a horrendous cop. Um, this is a very difficult decision. Uh, you know, there's lots of suffering that your family, the victim's family, all the victim's families. Uh, but I think you've done some good work um, since you've been in jail. My vote today would also be to make the recommendation you're sending to be to 60 years. So 
Um, you've received one vote that was not favorable, but four votes that were favorable. So we'll make that recommendation <laughs> on your behalf to the Good luck. Thank you, ma'am.